uh, want to welcome you to our program this evening. Um, Mary Byerly uh, is going to talk about her work and her journey. Um, I just want to give you a, a brief, not, well, it's not that brief, but give you a little bit of a, <laughs> a biography for Mary. Uh, she grew up alongside the Los Angeles mountains and she's trekked throughout the mountains and glaciers of the American West. The trembling of the tectonic shifts in that rugged terrain and the visual imprint of that geology are major influences in her work. She merges images of the landscape with abstracted human forms to explore our relationship with the natural world. Her sculptures evoke a tapestry of ideas ranging from the mundane to the heroic. These ideas are explored through the emerging and receding figures, glazing as subject and composition, and contrast of scale from miniature to massive. Larger than life-size pieces, she is inter, oh, massive, larger than life-size life size pieces, excuse me. She's interested in creating an experience of form and space that the viewer may touch, peer into and encounter from various perspectives. Mary initially studied biophysiology or bio, biopsychology, I guess it is, and began her formal arts studies after living in Europe and Asia. She received her uh, MFA from California State University, Long Beach, where she also received art travel grants to study Alaskan glaciers, Paleolithic uh, cave drawings and sculpture, and art studies in Italy, Korea, and China. Mary's art is in, internet, in international public and private collections and has been exhibited in the United States and Europe, including the Fet Picasso in, in uh, France, the American Museum of Ceramic Art here in Pomona, the Shoshana Wayne Gallery, the Salzbrand Ceramic Museum in Germany, Sam and Alfreda Malou Foundation for the Arts and Crafts, the W. Keith and Janet Kellogg University Art Gallery, San Bernardino County Museum, and the Wignall Museum Gallery, among others. She has received the Dan McGrath Award for Excellence in Art, the Art Graduate Award for Outstanding Achievement, Purchase Award Inc. and Clay 30, and the Beverly G. Alpay Art Award. I would like, uh, she, well, she currently teaches 2D and 3D art and ceramics at Cypress and Chafee College. And she is a resident artist at the American Museum of Ceramic Art in Pomona. I'd like to introduce Mary Byerly. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be talking in my, my home community. Um, it's taken me actually a while before I exhibited here. So thank you. Um, I, my art career is, as Paul Soldner once said, I had a, a, a class with him, um, a happy accident. I, when I was little, I thought I was always making things. And I thought I, I was a dancer. I studied dance and wrote poetry and, um, but in fourth, this is fourth grade and, um, I was supposed to make some kind of macaroni project and I started sculpting with it. It was supposed to be flat or something like that. And the teacher held it up and said, basically, you like, don't do that. This is like terrible. And I was good in math and science. So I just got jettisoned into the math and science um, programs and um, didn't really think about what I want, wanted to do until, um, until, um, Devin, my husband and I were in France and some of his friends, French friends, took us to the Lascaux II, which is a re recreation of the Lascaux Caves in France. And I don't know what happened to my brain at that point, but I'm in my 40s and I just start dreaming of ceramic art and I, I can't think about it. Uh, you know, if, if I'm daydreaming, I'm creating things in my head. And uh, one day my husband said to me, you know, you're always doing something for the family. Why don't you do something for yourself? So I signed up for a class at our local um, Chafee College and studied with um, Barbara Thompson and Chris Gonzalez. And um, if any of you know Chris, 
he was kind of this gruff guy. And um, my second class there, I was doing all this, it was for experimental firings. And Chris was really, he did some really fun stuff in this class. And um, he, I was like making these little sculptures because I didn't know anything about pottery. And he said, what are you doing, kid? And I said, um, yeah, I'm making sculptures to experiment with. And he goes, ah, you're taking too long. And he said, let me show you how to throw. And I was working with porcelain. Don't ask me why I was working with porcelain because if you've ever worked with it, it's like trying to work with paste. So he sets me down on the wheel with porcelain paste and he's trying to teach me how to throw. And I didn't have any idea what he was trying to teach me to throw at this point, I have no memory. But porcelain is such a beautiful material. And um, so whatever I was trying to throw didn't wasn't successful, but it started a series for me that I still continue to this day. And um, I, I cut this thing off of the, the wheel, the pottery wheel, and I started playing with it and sculpting it and um, started making multiples of these. And then um, it went through the first firing, so it got hard, the bisque firing. And then I took this porcelain, and here's the porcelain right here. And I started covering it with wet um, clay that had sand and grog in it. And, um, you know, just experimenting with putting iron and chrome and various chemicals inside the salt, lots of salt. And, um, and when it came out of the kiln, I, it wasn't what I was expected. And that's one of the dilemmas of ceramics. You know, you have something in your head and that's not necessarily what comes out of your hands. Um, and it was so different than I expected that I was kind of on the way to the, the trash can with it. And, um, and my professor stopped me and said, was really excited. And so it took me a while to understand why this was exciting because it's so brutal, it's so raw, it's so rough. And it it's, um, connects more with the Japanese tradition of wabi-sabi where there's something beautiful in the imperfect and um, this was so imperfect right but it grew on me really rapidly and so I continued making this series and um, so this is my first purchase was actually by the um, the Kellogg Museum and it was curated into a show by the Japanese curator from LACMA and purchased, um, selected for the purchase. So um, I, I, I don't do any series and, and stop it. And, I, and so when something inspires me again, I'll come back to a different, the series. And so you'll see this throughout. Um, so this is that. And then as the series evolved, I started um, enjoying kind of its flower-like shape. It's actually a Fibonacci sequence, um, like a spiral, if you look at a daisy or a nautilus shell or something like that. But it starts in the wheel, and it's still porcelain, and then I start playing with it, manipulating it. And um, I, I realized that I keep coming back to this for several reasons. One is because of its the brutality and this contrast between um, like these edges that I, I, I put dirt on them and fire it. And then these, you know, beautiful forms, it comes back to nature again for me. And um, I studied biology and field biology. I've studied so many different things, right? So many different paths to get here. Um, but it connects back to nature and also to this thing called the feminine principle that I learned um, in working with the Native Americans because I was working bef um, right before I started studying art and then early on in my artistic studies, I was working on documentaries with Native Americans. And I'll come back to that in a second. But the feminine principle is this principle that um, each of us men and women needs to have um, this feminine principle or this feminine spirit so that we can take care of our earth, we can take care of each other, we can take care of the elders and the children. And, um, and that's a theme that runs through all of my different series, all my different projects. 
And I think of them like little bonsai. Um, I love nature so much and I've studied the science of awe. And when we're in nature, our brains change actually. And we connect with each other. We lose the I and we become we when you're in an awe experience. And so often I feel like art can feel puny sometimes. Um, but my hope always is it's like a bonsai that you can look at this little recreation and have some glimmer and hope and recollection of connecting back to nature and to each other. And my mom started taking me to the Huntington Library and Gardens when I was in, in diapers. And I'm so grateful for that experience of being surrounded by beauty, which is another interesting topic because um, when I first started studying art um, in early 2000s, it was like, you can't say beauty. And I just think that's BS. I think beauty is so important. Um, it just lifts our spirit. And that's one of the things that drives my work. I'm looking to lift the viewer's spirit. I'm looking to connect to each other. I'm looking to connect to community. This is just another piece, you know, I think of these like the, the Buddha said to have held up a flower and um, used it as an example of a transportation into um, a, wire, a wider world than just our own little self-involvement. Uh, just details. I'm always experimenting with materials like, um, that I can throw into my glazes. Um, so like I said that, you know, those early pictures were early in my work, but I still continue this series. Um, I co-curated an exhibition for the National Conference for Education in the Ceramic Arts and um, using the flower as our connection. And all of us, we called it, I called it the subversive um, flower because I just connect, we just connected with uh, women across the United States who are all using the flower to communicate something. Um, I use it as a way of um, looking inward and seeing the beauty that's really at the center of our, our souls. Um, other people who are talking about the environment or sexuality, you know, 13 different things. All of us had a different proposal um, in our artwork um, that, we're, uh, that we are connecting to. This is just a detail. You know, I make my own clay bodies, but I love coming back to porcelain because you can make it as fine as paper. And if you babysit it, you know, it will dry without cracking to death and <clears throat> making these just exquisite little details in, in the work. And this is currently in uh, the Chapman University collection, the Escalante collection. Um, this one's um, now currently at the Li Shui Museum in China. And um, once again, it's like a little bonsai where it's a landscape um, let me, that um, is porcelain with experimental firings. I have no, I have a hope when I'm putting salt and grisly borate and um, different minerals and colorants and cobalt and iron on my work and dirt like these edges that's when I hike I, I'll, I'll pick up dirt or something and and find ways of incorporating it into our earth because we think we're so separate from the earth and we're always trying to control our environments but you know we're inexplicably linked to our planet in fact so much though that the about 20 years ago, discovered that touching soil, <laughs> which is clay, um, touching soil re releases endorphins in your brain and makes you feel good. And so just gardening, I mean, I think that's why it's a, a very important pastime for people because it can bring us so much pleasure. And so this is just a little micro, uh, you know, a small landscape for me that I'm hoping that the viewer gets pleasure from. And then this is just a detail um, 
of that with um, the cobalt becoming green like a landscape and the, the cobalt becoming blue like a river. And, um, my, and I think it also reflects the form of a human too. This is just another detail of a piece I'm working on right now. I'm trying to figure out if I'm not even gonna fire it. It's porcelain. And I like the fact that it's fragile and that if you bump into this or touch it too hard, it's gonna break because it has, hasn't been fired yet. And you know, if it was to collapse, I would be a little sad, but I think that's part of the process you know, of the piece, maybe I would just photograph the crumbling nature and maybe it would just be, um, if it if it did break, just be a, only a, an ephemeral and be viewable through a photograph. I don't know, I'm dwelling on that. Um, so one of my art grants took me to uh, Blauburen, Germany, where in about 2009, the Germans had discovered this carving of this female form um, that we sometimes call like, uh, many people who've taken art history have heard of the Venus of Willendorf. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of these things. They're, and they're carved into cave walls. They're sculpted originally before we had the clay process. This is almost 40,000 years old and humans hadn't figured out the clay process yet. So it's carved bone. Um, but they also carved it out of stones. And then about 30,000 years ago, um, they were making them out of ceramics. So they had this exhibition with their finding and the, the translation of this basically, is this pornography or is this um, like a goddess? Because um, I think the next picture shows some of these, they're small and so some, archaeologists or historians, art historians have suggested that perhaps this was pornography or a children's toy, you know, not significant, but I've actually seen um, these from, um, from about in different museums and things that are 3000 years old to 40, almost 40,000 years old. And um, I don't think that they're insignificant. I don't think they're a toy. And there's all, so, and this, exhibition was asking that, is it a goddess? And if you think about where does all life come from? It comes from the female, always. And so perhaps she was 40,000 years ago until more um, monotheistic religions was the creatrix. And, you know, she's small because during the Ice Age times, we were roaming the earth. We weren't there's no civilization. There were no villages, permanent villages. And so they had to be small to take them with them. And, you know, the carving on them is beautiful. And they're, some of them look old and saggy and look like they have stretch marks carved into them. So they're often women who have given birth and things like that. Um, so this began rattling around in my, in my head. Oh, oh, also just, um, viewing all of these caves. I love the fact that we were all makers. You know, it's special now. Sometimes I'll have students in my class that have never made anything. They haven't de um, decorated a cupcake um, or anything. And, but at one time we made everything. That's in our, we're wired, that's in our DNA. And I love the fact that this was created. This is how creative humans are. And this is how our brains work. You know, this is uh, 18,000 years ago. So humans thought, oh, I've got this hollow bird bone. Bird bones are hollow. And I'm gonna just take some soil that's really red, that's naturally occurring. I'm gonna mix it with some spit in my mouth and some animal fat. I'm gonna swirl that around and blow it through this bird bone straw, like a straw. <laughs> Stone Age straw, and then use my hand for a stencil. And um, so it might have been communicating something, it might have been just fun, but we also saw someone put a child's handprint up really high. So they had to lift the child up because the floor was the same floor approximately within inches as it was 18,000 years ago, and put a child's hand up there and blew it. 
Um, so, you know, just if you ever have a chance to go visit these caves in Europe, I highly recommend it. It'll, it'll blow your mind. And, you know, also in this um, cave crawl, but I had a chance to look at um, art from almost 40,000 years ago. Um, this was 2,000 years ago, the winged victory of Samothrace in the Louvre Museum. Um, also, you know, it's just, it wasn't made by a woman, but it's just a, this, such a strong woman's body, you know, this victorious image that haunts me. And I keep recreating in uh, my own, um, in my own way. Um, so I, you know, I started thinking about the, you know, the woman and um, her body and my own body. My my work is very personal at this point, still. And this is like all the stages of being a woman to me. My reinterpretation of the winged victory of Samothrace, um, and I just relate to a um, rock so much. I I uh, rock climbed it at one point in my life and I just love grasping this huge boulder. And um, so there's, if I didn't tell you this was the winged victory of Samothrace, you probably wouldn't ever guess that. But this is the wings on my body at this point, just coming into my own as a human being. I love not being young. <laughs> This piece is about the menarch, which is the first day of a girl's period. And I actually had about um, 600 or 700, 800 petals at one point. And um, when I'd exhibit it and women would understand what this piece was about, often they would cry and I would just give the viewer um, petals. So I should have taken photographs of this piece before. I gave away hundreds of petals, but um, they were just strewn about like a blood flow, like a flower, um, just celebrating um, that transition into womanhood. This one's about aging, you know, just like looking at the like, creepiness of my skin and growths on my body. Over here, I had found this mold I still don't know what the mold actually was. I cast it in aluminum. Um, I had these benign tumors in my body. And so, you know, just like the changes that happen to us as we age, crazy. Um, and then, and then as I, then as I started having, um, more recollections of my time with the Native Americans. Because when I was working on these documentaries um, with Gail Kelly and One Bowl Productions and got, getting to travel all across America, meeting all these uh, medicine men and women and elders and chiefs who are still doing ceremonies all over the planet for humans and our planet. And, um, and they were constantly talking, even though, constantly talking about climate change. This, back in the 90s, there were serious concerns. And uh, one of the documentaries was about um, these, a march to the United Nations to talk to all the people of the world about the serious problems that they were seeing because they were living on the land and looking at the stars and their crops, if they were gonna survive, depended on rain. They didn't have irrigation, like in Hopi and things. It's, um, their crops. If there was no rain, there was no crop. And <clears throat> recently, scientists have speculated that by the end of this century, you know, if we don't change our ways, there won't be any Joshua trees in Joshua Tree National Monument because the babies aren't surviving because they're made to survive de desert weather, but they do need some rain. And if the babies can't have rain for the first years of their life, um, we won't have them become adults. And at some point, these beautiful older trees will all be dead. So I don't know, that began floating around in my head a lot. And I began my Weeping Underwater series. And my inspiration was in the, the dry lake beds, you know, that are, are happening. <clears throat> and some of my work is very ephemeral. 
And this is um, just a, phot uh, a photograph of clay on my arm drying. And um, I love these ephemeral moments. Um, and this is uh, the first of my series, Weeping Under Water. This is um, just thinking about how, uh, because the Native American um, elders told me where there is no water will be less water, where there's a lot of water will be more water. They'll be subjected to more floods, more droughts, more wind, <clears throat> things like that. And so this is like me in a kind of fetal position, perhaps weeping, but there's no water. Maybe I'm looking for water. This is another one. And um, when I've exhibited this, I actually give the spectator the opportunity to um, write on a piece of paper and, and stick it into the crevices like a weeping wall. Um, this piece is completely raw clay. It's never been fired. And I was doing these experiments and accidentally discovered that I can grow popcorn in damp clay. And so this piece, um, when it was exhibited, I invited the viewers to come spray it because it, and if they didn't, it would, those, those seedlings would die. And it's just a metaphor for me that, um, of children, let me do a close up of that, a detail. Because um, this is a female form, kind of like, and my body, and we give birth and they're, everything's interconnected. You can't raise a child on your own. You put a woman and a baby in the wilderness on their own, they're, they're gonna die, right? We need each other, we're all connected. And um, we can't just think about ourselves. and we need to nourish each other and our children. This is Chief Orrin Lyons and um, we became friends. <clears throat> and he said to me one day, it's like, oh, you think you have problems, you don't have problems. You don't have the problems you think you have. The ice is melting and um, that's gonna be your biggest problem you're gonna have migration problems and food problems and weather problems. And he said, and you don't need to worry about another mother nature. She's gonna take care of herself. But you know, what's gonna to happen to humans? That depends on their actions now. And this was like 20 years ago, he was telling me that. So it's kind of sad to see how slow we're moving on this. So um, I wrote some grants to go visit North America's largest Calving Glacier. This is six miles wide, over 300 feet tall, and then drops down into that bay. And listen to the name of this bay is the Bay of Disenchantment. Drops down into that body of water, um, about 600 more feet. And I was having trouble finding someone because the only way to get there is either through a cruise ship and then you have to be a half mile away. But there's this uh, native village in it and that has commercial fishermen at it too. And they make big bucks every summer because millions and mil tens of millions of salmon come through here in the summer months and uh, halibut too. And so the fishermen make a lot of money. They don't want to take an artist to go see this. But I found this guy who actually went to Cal State Long Beach and his wife studied in the program where I got my MFA. And so he goes, oh, okay, I'll take you. So he took my husband and myself, his mom who was visiting, and this um, chef at the at the place we were staying, because he goes, I can't, I got to take somebody else rather than just you. I have to make some kind of money to pay for my gas. So, but he was a uh, oh, and a NOAA scientist. So he often took the NOAA scientists. So it was really fun hearing him talk about you know this landscape and the animals here and things. So we had our own private tour. We were within spitting distance of this. If it had calved, we would have died. You could see high water marks where the month before um, a, a huge piece of this knocked off and went up a hundred feet into the air. It was pretty dramatic. <clears throat> we also had the opportunity to go into this ice cathedral. And this thing 
is about as big as Notre Dame. It's huge. And that's the opening way over there that you could just walk into. And this was so, such a bizarre experience. And this is gone now, it's melted. The, the glaciers are melting so quickly. It's um, quicker than the scientists had even predicted. Oops. Um, and the place we were staying also said, you know, I'm not sure, but there's this lake. And if you drive on this um, dirt road and borrow a kayak from us and rent a truck and drive over the bridge to nowhere, uh, I think there's some calved glaciers in this lake. And um, we found them. And so we had to haul up these kayaks about a mile upstream. And we were the only people on this lake. Um, it was stunning. Uh, I can't even describe, and, and these are all gone now too, melting. It's just, I mean, it's 90 degrees up there sometimes right now. This is all disappearing so rapidly. It's frightening. <clears throat> but like, how do you interpret that? Like how, as an artist or as a human, how, how do you make that meaningful? And it was, I couldn't do anything with these images for a long time. It was, it was gut-wrenching for me. But once again, the Huntington Library and Gardens saved me. And because I love the stone garden. Ever since I was a child, this is my favorite thing at the Huntington Library and Gardens. And once again, these aren't mountains and that's not a river, of course. But when you go there, you can feel something. And so I, when I make this work, I just cling to the fact that maybe I can create a space for a human to have some quiet, especially nowadays, right? I don't know about you, but my brain's rattling. And a, a, a place to connect with nature, our thoughts, um, our inner selves, and the we that we get with a sense of, of awe. Um, so this, just me working on these sculptures, uh, they're on fire at this point. They go into a really large kiln. <clears throat> it takes me months to make these things, get them fired, get them glazed. Um, at this point, I've probably done 2000 glaze tests for all of these things. Um, just experimenting with materials and glazes. I make my own glazes, the clay body for this. And you know, how, how to make this larger. So, um, I had my family, my daughters, help me with this project and my husband. And um, so this is my artwork. This is in a room and the, these walls, there's a projection on these walls. And I think I can play that. This is just a detail of um, that sculpture. It's called breathing. Let me see if I can cue that up here. Oops, sorry. Huh, dang.
Um, so, sorry, that, so you're seeing it on your tiny screen. You have to imagine it's being projected into a dark room. We feel like you're walking into a cave and um, you're, you're in the darkness with that 10, 12 feet high. Um, and I was just thinking about Chief Orrin Lyons telling me, you know, you, you don't have to worry about mother nature. She's gonna keep, she's gonna take care of herself. What's gonna happen to humans? Um, and so that was my interpretation of that in another way. Um, so um, this is, I've been making this series for a while cause it's still interesting to me, um, but I call it memories of vanishing things. Um, like souvenirs almost. And I create these little sitting cubes so that the viewer can sit and it dramatically actually changes the perspective of the piece when you sit. And I think it stills the brain a little bit. Um, and just an inside view, cause I actually don't care if people see these as glaciers or not necessarily. Um, because in the inside, it's that flower again. It's like the excavation series. Uh, it's convoluted. Um, it's more visceral. And just a, a detail. And another version of that. And a detail. Like some of these have like 20 gallons of glaze on them. And if you've ever, um, if you're a painter, you can imagine 20 gallons of paint or, um, but it takes me weeks just to glaze these things. Um, I um, was invited to um, submit designs. This is at Pomona College, their organic farm. Uh, a former Pomona College student and a benefactor um, had these gates created, the farm gates. And so I just wanted it to be an invitation to the farm because people didn't even know the organic farm was here and I wanted something colorful. As I, I spent uh, weeks visiting the farm and looking at the different produce that they were growing and the flowers and the indigenous plant garden um, that they had there. And um, it was really a fun project getting to walk there and meet all the student workers and the manager. And um, if you have never done ceramics, your glaze, when you glaze, it's not like paint because it's this color before it's fired. Um, and I had the opportunity to um, work with a, a studio assistant and just continued falling in love with working with um, people and community. And I love this being a community project um, and an invitation. So um, some details of the plants and beautiful vegetables that I saw growing there. So then I was invited um, to participate in the public sculpture program at Cal State University Bakersfield and um, work with students who are in a public sculpture class. And so we are doing work. I, uh, for 30 years, they've invited artists from around the world to create a sculpture for the campus to be in the public domain. And uh, this is the first time they worked with the class. And so um, that was really exciting. And um, so I created this um, sculpture. They helped me uh, make hundreds, pr probably about 2000 pounds of clay for a couple of sculptures. Um, and it's still in limbo. It's campus is still closed. So this is waiting to be installed in the fine arts area. And it's basically another version of the, the wing victory of Samothrace. Um, but with the soil from um, the fields that are all over Bakersfield, 
And as I would drive, it was winter and there'd be all these clouds and snow and landscapes. And um, that sculpture is just full of all the visions, this connection of earth and mountains and landscape and civilization. Cause that wing Victoria Samothrace is the epitome of civilization, Greek civilization. Um, and so this clash, um, this merger of civilization humans, environment. Um, this is the other sculpture I was working on there. And um, meanwhile, my um, husband and some other great people um, founded Chirp Locally Grown Power. This is the world's first nonprofit solar factory. And, uh, <clears throat> and it's brand new technology that is light years ahead of what's out there. And factories have been leaving the United States since the eighties. And the inventor of this new technology um, contacted my husband, my husband was giving a lecture, Mrs. Devin Hartman. And um, he said, I, I'm a prolific inventor. That means you have more than a certain amount. He said, your cell phone has, I can't remember, it was two or three of my inventions in here. But he said, I'm part of the problem. My inventions get purchased by venture capitalists and get manufactured overseas. And I thought, how can I help the environment? How can I help our communities? How can I bring back jobs to America? And he went back to square one and did all the calculations for solar panels and reinvented how they're, they're made with his crew. And um, so, you know, Devin's been fielding questions from people across the United States about this as he gives his lectures and things. And I said, wow, you know, number one, we're gonna have people in here. Do you really wanna work in a, a white building? I said, number two, how are we gonna explain this to humans, you know, people? And I said, you know, art's a great communicator and we have an opportunity to make this a fabulous place to come not only visit, but work in. And so, um, and you know, how do we engage with the community, lift everybody's spirits up? Because we're all related. You know, the Native Americans, when I was working with them, like everything's their brother and sister, that soil outside your house, the stones, the, the, the sky and each other. And not only, you know, we hear about um, certain areas being sacred lands, all of the earth is sacred to them. Like what a mind shift that would be if we thought of everything as sacred and that every we are in relationship to everything. And so, you know, just bringing all those thoughts into this factory. Um, I reached out to an artist I've known for a long time, Athena Hahn, and I asked her to help me. And she had just, was just finishing up a project for the Pomona, library and it's under lock and key because of the pandemic but this i think that's this is just one of seven panels it's like 30 feet long or something but i love the way um i look at this and it just lifts my spirit and i said yeah can you help us and she was researching rainbows and she um discovered P peter erskine and reached out to him and we began having conversations with him and he like a solar panel using sunlight to create energy. This guy for the last 30 years exhibits all over the world. He's been invited to work in Rome and LA Union Station and just everywhere. And he takes sunlight, brings it in through skylights, um, has the sunlight reflect on prisms and mirrors and brings it into spaces. And one of the things he found accidentally was when you walk through a rainbow, you're, you get, you feel healthy. And he actually had the opportunity to talk to Jonas Salk um, before he died. And um, Salk said, you know, we are wired genetically um, to have significance in rainbows and it's just in our DNA to feel better. And so we're, he's agreed um, to work with us. So, you know, we're raising funds to put a hole in the roof of the factory and, have all his prisms um, and, and mirrors drop a rainbow 
into um, a common area that people can walk, walk through during the day and it'll shift all day long. And he brought in one of his friends, Bruce Odland, who's a composer and a musician, and he calls himself a sonic thinker. I think that's like so cool, right? And he's invented various ways. Here he is working in, uh, in Greece uh, at the time he was using this invention of his, this tube that he was collecting all these urban noises, because that is so discordant to our human brain. Um, it's different than the sounds of birds. It's different than the sounds of music. And it really disrupts our ability to have calmness, all this urban noise that we've only really had like for the last 200 years with um, industrial um, uh, having become industrialized nations. And he converts it um, with synthesizers and things into not bird sounds and stuff, but harmonious sounds that our brains can handle. So this factory is gonna have his inventions of new ways of collecting uh, discord noises and, and then transmitting it into these speakers uh, when we're finished raising funds for this. Um, and this is just one of um, Athena's banners that are going in, just a way of communicating what's going on. Um, you know, she's just there uh, getting it ready to be hoisted into the, the factory space. And we're painting a mural um, so we can thank all the people that um, have contributed so much to making this nonprofit. Um, factory, and it's a model for factories all across the United States. It looks like the next one will be um, in uh, LA. We'll also um, have conversations with coal country in West Virginia. But the goal is to have them, hundreds of them, throughout the, the United States, making jobs, creating solar panels, changing, you know, changing our connection, um, lifting up our spirits. Um, and so, you know, art's a process. I just love it. There's so many ways to engage, not just as the artist in the, in the, alone in the studio, but how we can connect with our community and uh, lift all of our spirits up. We're also in the process of working with uh, Cal Poly's Children's Theater Program and the Dog Gallery. They have this puppet, hopefully explaining um, solar panels, not only to children, but adults in a really playful, happy way. Um, this is Bethlehem um, doing the puppeteering and just engaging. So I still, <laughs> I still have my own series going on in my head. And these are just my mock hats for the Stele series, memorial series. I mean, Stele have been used for thousands of years to commemorate you know, fabulous events, ceremonial events, but also um, memorializing. And I'm just thinking about the, the plants and animals that are disappearing from our planet due to climate change. And uh, some of these stile will be memorials to them. These are just maquettes at this point. They're small, they'll be big. And then um, currently you can see my work at the California Botanic Garden here in Claremont. Um, were invited by AMOCA and the California Botanic Garden for the exhibition Clayfornia. And um, I think these pictures were um, taken by Catherine McIntosh. So thanks, big shout out to her. Thank you. And then once again, a reminder, we're all, we're all makers. It's whether it's music or dance or business or science, you know, um, humans, we're interesting. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. So any questions? Wow. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Mary, I'm going to um, maybe if you could um, remove your or stop the share. Screen, stop the share and then yeah, so we can see and uh, and now I thought, you know, let's let's open up to some questions for Mary, and you can, um, if you want to, um, you know, write your question in the chat. Feel free to do that, and I'll uh, communicate it. But um, you know, if you have questions that you want to just 
turn on your microphone and ask it. Um, feel free. Maybe we should. I would love it if they asked me a question. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, you can raise your hand under reactions down at the bottom. Hey, Devin, did I forget anything? <laughs> My husband. You, you can never get everything in in an hour. So it was beautiful. Yeah, it was amazing. I was blown away, actually. And, um, and maybe I, I have had kind of a question because it, it seems like you really didn't start doing your art until kind of later in life. And, yeah. you know, this was not as an undergrad student. So, um, and, and I think you kind of mentioned one of the, the pivotal points was um, seeing the, um, the cave. Let's go. Yeah. yeah. And, and so that, that was what started the journey for you? Yeah. I for like five years, I couldn't get these images. I was just, would wake up and it really rattled my brain in some primordial way. And I, um, and so Devin said to me one day, you got to do something for yourself. You're always like kids and me and like work and stuff. And uh, I just took a class. I, it was so funny because like I was surrounded by people that were like half my age or more than half my age and uh, they were doing all these fabulous things. Meanwhile, I was throwing my clay on the ground and stomping on it. I had no idea that my teachers, uh, Barbara Thompson and uh, Chris Gonzalez had studied with the Volkus group and that they were part of Jerry Rothman and Paul Solner and that whole creative group that was doing all these exploratory things. So she didn't think, I, they didn't think I was crazy. They were like, oh yeah, we know who your people are. You know, um, so I'm so grateful. If I had a different teacher, I probably would have flunked the class. <laughs> so I guess you didn't get a chance to, to study with Paul Solner when you were at Scripps. That would have been fun. I actually took a class with him, you know, but at this oh. The, the pain of having my work held up as a, a an eight-year-old kid and being so like this is terrible like um I took a class with him where I took two classes with him one when I was young where we went and visited Casanova and probably and Beth probably your dad too he took us all around to studios and their work was so amazing and I just and all we did was go observe and talk to artists you know famous artists and I came you know I just think I could never do that I could I can't imagine doing that 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 would that's so magnificent how do you do that <laughs> it wasn't until I had to do it did I start to imagine being able to do it I just couldn't get these images out of my head and and then I took once I started uh, Chris Gonzalez sent me to a workshop that Paul Solner was doing at Scripps where he was doing low salt firing. And because I was doing those, um, he was, Chris Gonzalez was trying to get me to make work faster and pottery so much faster than sculpting. And, but it was not successful. And I was just sculpting with this um, beautiful porcelain clay. And, um, and then starting to like win awards with the work. And there was someone, in my classes, who's going like, Mary can't even throw a big vase. And so I was feeling like shame. I go into shame so easily. And it derails me so quickly. And it's like, oh yeah, yeah, I can't throw a big pot. You know, I'm just like, my work is an accident. And the first thing out of Paul Soldner's mouth in that uh, workshop, that three-day workshop was like, look for the happy accident. And I'm like, what? <laughs> a lot of my work is accidents. Um, and he saved me. He saved me. He saved me. I went out of shame at, you know, at least for that moment, <laughs> not body of work. Mary, um, this is Marilee Howard. I'm, uh, I live on the Oregon coast. Wow. I just wanted to observe that your flower um, projects, uh, particularly working in the porcelain with the glaze, remind those forms remind me a lot of um, oyster shells and and sea sea shapes. Um, there even even the frayed edges and the um, 
the the variegations and um, you know oyster in the shell as opposed to out of the shell and uh, and the smooth and the rough and the dirt and the sand and it just you know that those images really resonated with me because I see them every day. Yeah. Well, you know, our lives come into our, our work, right? And the Huntington Library, one of the reasons my mom loved to go there was because all the flowers that bloom. These flowers bloom in the winter, you know, as it's coming to spring and spring and summer and fall. And um, so the flowers always in my head unconsciously. I realized because you have to write about your work and it took me years to figure out what, what, why am I doing this? And then I've scuba dived for most of my life, you know, so, and, and then the way that they're made with uh, starting on the potter's wheel and then taking them and doing the Fibonacci sequence, uh, a mathemat uh, mathematician um, has shown that very simple equations when you do it a million, a billion times make very complex things. And so these, the Fibonacci sequence that's in that is in the oyster shell, is in the flower, is in so many things. And so, you know, some people will go, oh, it looks like coral or it looks like this. And it's like, you know, I just hope it, you know, it just brings people some kind of joy or sense of beauty, um, some, some richness to their life. Other questions? I don't have I don't have a question. I just want to say this was such a wonderful hour to spend with you, Mary. You just touched on so many things that are so real and so important. And thank you very much. Thank you. It was a joy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you to my students for being here. Appreciate that. Yeah, it was a wonderful time. Glad yes. to be here. Thank you. Um, Thanks. And we, we look forward to sharing it with uh, the rest of uh, all our fine arts members and supporters. And we'll be on YouTube for for indefinitely. So thank you, Catherine. Anybody, feel free to share it. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. I, I actually have a question about like since a lot of your work revolves around abstraction and um, you put yourself as well as like your overall style into every piece of artwork and you can definitely see it and feel it. Um, but what, why is it and how do you kind of like start off with this, with your process of abstraction, especially since they're coming from real like events that are still like happening and have been happening? Um, yeah, you know, like I don't, I think I talked about my experimentation enough. I often make maquettes. You know, I start at a smaller scale and I go up. And then as I'm building up, I might not have the engineering right. And so it might fall apart and break. There's so much breakage and um, failure. <laughs> you, I, if I didn't embrace failure, I, I would have to quit. Um, and so, um, you know, and often, like I was talking about earlier, like I don't know what I have. And sometimes it takes me a couple of years. Like I'm so grateful to be married to my husband. I don't think I could be an artist without my family um, because he gets my work before I do. I'm so judgy with my own work. It's painful. And often I'll be making a project and I have to call him in because I'm ready to destroy it. And he'll go, no, just fix this part. I'm like, okay. And he's right. Um, and abstraction, I don't, I love abstraction. I don't know why. Um, partly because you feel it rather than know it. You know, it, it enters the viewer unconsciously. And, and I like that slow process. You know, do I enjoy looking at other people's um, realistic work? Yeah, I love all art. Um, but for me, I like the viewer to have a very slow entrance. And if they walk by it, they'll miss it. And so I always put things in my pieces that if the viewer will take the time, they will be rewarded. There's always something special for them. 
Um, so it's a lot of dreaming, like I'll wake up or <laughs> our roof needed to be redone and it was leaking and there was this crack in it and the stain and it looked like a, a human, human figure to me, an abstracted human figure. And I recreated that. Um, so uh, it's, it's a process that's not linear. It's like, me, 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 I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, it's gonna fail, it's gonna break. I walk away, I come back. Um, it's time. Creativity takes time. You have to be bored. And often we don't allow ourselves to be bored anymore. Like Netflix and you know Zoom things. You just have to sit sometimes. And um, sometimes I'll just go lay in the grass and look up. So. Wow. That's words of wisdom. Uh, unless there are any other comments or questions, I think um, we're going to wrap things up. And I just want to thank you so much, Mary, for taking the time to be with us today and to share your, your journey in art. Um, it was very personal and, and very, um, very deep, which um, 